everyone. Welcome to the Shift Book Club. I'm journalist and creator of The Shift, Sam Baker, and I'm really delighted to be here with Jean Kwok, author of The Leftover Woman, which is here. Jean, if you... Oh, are there two? We're matching. Is that mine's a proof copy? Yay. Jean is the award-winning author of four New York Times and internationally best-selling novels, Girl in Translation, Mambo in Chinatown, which I think is not available in the UK. Is that right? I don't know, Sam. I'm sorry. I have no idea at this point. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it's all <laughs> uh, Searching for Sylvie Lee and now The Leftover Woman, which is a book about wealth, privilege, race, family, country, class, belonging, and what it makes to make a mother, what it takes to make a mother. Um, it's an evocative and propulsive mystery that packs a profound emotional punch, as I know most of you know, because we were talking about it in chat last week. Um, Jean now lives between the United States and the Netherlands. She's coming to us from the Netherlands tonight. But be gentle, because she's just flown from Hawaii via LA and has the jet lag from hell. So um, if she falls over, we'll know why. Um, Jean, when Jean was five, her parents emigrated from Hong Kong to Brooklyn. She worked in a Chinatown clothing factory for much of her childhood and was accepted to a public secondary school for gifted children. She was then granted early admission to Harvard to study physics. Well, I'm going to ask you about that later. And once there, she switched, got a BA in English and then did an MFA in fiction from at Columbia. At the same time, working four jobs and one of which was a professional ballroom dancer. You're nothing if not versatile, Jean. Um, <laughs> Jean has taught in universities and colleges across the world and is also fluent in Chinese, Dutch and English. Um, welcome to the Shift Book Club, Jean. It's really lovely to meet you. Sam, thank you so much for having me. Um, I do have a very insane schedule right now, but I would not have missed coming on to talk to you and to your um, people for anything. Oh, thank you. Um, before we get into The Leftover Woman, which is so much to talk about, I would like to talk to you a little bit about your own journey from that little five-year-old who lands in, in Brooklyn, unable to speak English, and to best-selling novelist, because that that journey does feed really deeply into your novels, doesn't it? It does. Absolutely. And I think The Leftover Woman is certainly one of my most personal novels um, to date in that, you know, we uh, I had quite a hard time as a child because we were extremely poor and I was born in British Hong Kong. We moved to the United States um, and I, I didn't speak any English. The little English that I did know was British English. And you may well know that some words are still different. You know, even if you might speak generally the same language, the nuances of the language are um, are different. So I, you know, when, even when I finally did learn some English, I would go up to the teacher and ask to if I could borrow a rubber and then the whole class would burst out laughing because that's a condom um, in the United States. Oh, so God. The, yes, there are all kinds of issues like that. Um, but indeed, we were very poor. I worked in a Chinatown clothing factory for most of my childhood, starting when I was five years old. Our apartment in Brooklyn, in the slums of Brooklyn, was not even heated. So, you know, New York, it can... Are you guys are in Celsius, right? Are you Celsius or Fahrenheit? Um, I think we kind of use a bit of both, but it's okay. when it's very hot or very cold, we tend to use Fahrenheit, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you know, it, of course, it goes down to zero or below zero um, Fahrenheit, which can be like minus 20 Celsius in New York in the winter. So it was ridiculously cold. Um, it was not legal, the circumstances under which we lived. But we were new immigrants and we were legal immigrants, but we did not know. Um, and so it was it was hard. And then I think on a more personal note, what was hard for me is I was the youngest of seven children. I am female. And so in terms of both age and gender, I was at the very bottom of the Chinese family hierarchy. And, you know, there was a clear preference for boys, the men knew it better 
the men were supposed to be respected. Um, we were all supposed to be boys. Uh, we should have been boys. So uh, it was, you know, it was difficult growing up in a family like that, where I was clear, I, I'm a terrible housekeeper and terrible cook and a complete failure at being a Chinese girl in basically every single way that counted to my very traditional family. Um, so that, you know, feeling of being unseen and unheard is one that is very much in Jasmine in The Leftover Woman. And were you the only girl? Are your siblings all brothers? Well, it felt like I was the only girl. So in my family, it goes two girls um, and then four boys and then 10 years and then oh. me. So oh. by the time I was born, my sisters were really out of the house and married and gone. Um, and so I grew up, you know, with four boys who are all much older than me, even the closest one was 10 years older than I was. Um, so yes, so it didn't feel like I had a lot of allies in the house. Do you think that that kind of the powerlessness of your situation at home, like being the youngest and technically the only girl, and also having lost your language because you'd moved to a country where nobody understood you, do you think those thing, two things collided? Oh yeah, I mean, it definitely made things much harder. And, you know, I learned the language after a few years, of course, I, I, although there were many years when I would go to school and just come back with zeros over all of my papers because the teacher did not care. I had some wonderful educators, but I had some that really did not care that I couldn't understand the language and couldn't do what she was asking of me because I simply did not understand um, but then as I grew older, you know, I, I kind of have a conflation of the first generation and the second generation problems because I am a first generation immigrant, but I'm young enough to be in the generation of the second generations. And so I had those classic problems of wanting to go out, wanting to be with my friends, wanting to do things that my friends could do that I was absolutely not allowed to do from my family. And in fact, as I got older, you mentioned I was a physics major. I was on a total science track until I went to university. And um, when I was in high school, I got a job at the Molecular Biology Laboratory at Sloan Kettering, which is uh, extremely prestigious. And, you know, I really, really wanted to do it. And I went home. I told my parents about it because, of course, they had to give permission and they didn't say, oh, my goodness, you must be so smart. So great that you received this position at this prestigious laboratory. They said, um, "Is who's running the lab? Is it a man? And I said, yes, it is. And they said, well, you can't take that job. They said, it's, you know, it's inappropriate for a young girl to be working with a man. So that is the kind of thing I was up against. Mm. God. And then you were also yeah. up against kind of everything else, you know, the other the opportunities that the other kids had. That you, oh, you didn't yeah. Have because you were going, you know, going from school to work, presumably. Absolutely. And, you know, for my Harvard application, I had to waive the fee because we couldn't afford the I think at that time, I don't know, it was fifty dollars or something that you had to pay. Uh, for the application and I I know from one of my friends who I knew um, who I met after I was accepted and I was at Harvard that her father had um, just kind of calmly inserted a little check for $250,000 with her application <laughs> just as a little gesture oh of goodwill um, so you have me on the one hand who didn't even pay <laughs> the $50 mm -hmm. and then you have people like that um, on the other it's crazy isn't it absolutely crazy very so, different worlds having kind of I mean effectively fought your way up through there what made you decide to move to the Netherlands after doing your MFA well I met um, a Dutch guy and we okay. fell in love and so I moved to the Netherlands but sadly we are getting divorced so um, that just, 
Yes, thank you. That just hit um, about a year ago. It was a surprise to me as well. So this last year has been extremely tumultuous with my, um, I'm really a planner, you know, so I had my whole mm. life planned and I had, it just says I plan my books. I mean, I can't plan them all in advance, but I do think very much about the structure. I'm very much looking ahead. I'm not just kind of wandering around writing my novels because I want my novels to be a very propulsive, fun read for the readers. So in my life, I'm the same way. I had the next 30 years planned up uh, out and then the whole thing exploded. Um, and then this year, as you know, The Leftover Woman came out as well. So I've been doing publicity and on book tour. I've been in the U.S. for, I think I was there for about three weeks. And then within the span of something like a week, I had flown from New York to California um, to Seattle, then back to New York, and then to Canada, then back to New York, then back to the Netherlands. I had a few days, and then I flew to Hawaii, um, then from Hawaii to Los Angeles, Los Angeles, back to the Netherlands. You are, I landed today, um, and I was actually supposed to fly to Iceland tomorrow, but I canceled. Mm -hmm. I did cancel that, because I don't know if you've heard the news, um, but volcano eruption. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because that's Iceland Noir, isn't it? Which is, um, for anybody who doesn't know, and there's no reason why you would, absolutely brilliant crime festival in Reykjavik. And everybody goes just because you can go to Reykjavik. So you always see loads of really interesting people there. But they said they were going ahead. Have they now cancelled or did you just can did you cancel? They have not cancelled. Um, they are going ahead. It's We're really so close to it. Nobody knows what to do. It's balanced on the edge of a knife. I mean, basically, Dan Brown is already there. Uh, I know they have some really big stars scheduled. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends are going, some have not. I just felt like I am, well, I wasn't feeling well. So physically, I wasn't feeling well as well. And uh, I am so exhausted by my schedule as it is. I've been to Iceland Noir. I went last year. Um, and I, it, there's a volcano about to erupt. So I just, I, everyone has to make their own decision, but I do know there's only one road on Iceland. There's one highway. Yeah. <laughs> and, and last year, um, a few weeks after the conference, thousands of people had gone stuck at the airport, living out of vending machines and sleeping on the floor because just because of the weather, because it's, you know, it, it's not like a country where you could go out and pick mangoes off the tree and live for a few days, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're really, you know, you're really very dependent on the infrastructure working. Um, and because I'm not feeling well, and I actually am under deadline to hand in another manuscript, and the volcano looks like it's going to erupt any moment, I did, yeah. um, I did cancel. But I believe they are going on. I hope that everyone stays safe and it all goes well. Yeah, I think it's crossed. I mean, the volcano is about um, that peninsula is only what 30, 40 miles from Reykjavik. So fingers crossed. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. They're making it sound like it's so far away. But actually, um, I, I don't think that Reykjavik is going to be overrun with lava. I don't think that's no, the problem. No, no that's good. It's going to be fine. The problem is that um, the town that's in danger is close to a power station which powers a great deal of the peninsula. There's one road and what they are not really saying is it's very close to the airport. Yeah, so, very you close. know, so if yeah. the airport goes down, nobody's getting out. And if the lava flow bursts out underneath the ocean and a part of that lava is under the ocean, if it happens to spew out from underwater, you will have an ash cloud that can disrupt all flights, um, even to Europe and to the rest of us. So hopefully yeah. that won't happen. Hopefully it will just be a small lava eruption. I hope it misses the town altogether. And yeah. that may well happen. But with my personal circumstances, and I'm not even done yet. After this, I'm, I think I'm going to Edinburgh and I'm going to be in Paris. So... I thought, well, well, maybe it's just better, especially yeah. since I'm not feeling well. To Stay skip in bed. I yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Stay in bed. Uh, exactly. Let's talk about 
Let's talk about the leftover woman. Before we get into talking about the characters, Jasmine and Rebecca, um, can you tell us a bit more about the term, the leftover woman, what the phrase and, and what it means? Yes, well, you know, the leftover woman has two meanings um, in terms of the book. You know, the, the one that is from outside of the book is that, as you all probably know, this story is very much um, to do with the one child policy, which was implemented in China for decades, forcing families to have one child, as a result of which there are 32 million more Chinese men in China today than women. So we are missing 32 million girls um, somehow, somewhere. And it's a horrifying statistic. But this policy was imposed on a fairly rural country where people were used to having big, big families like mine um, because children did not all survive to adulthood. So people had big families. There was no real um, you know, social benefits program to take care of you if you were sick or if you were old. So it was all based on having children to help you. And, you know, girls officially marry out of the family in my culture and boys stay. So without a boy, it was thought that your family line would be extinguished. Furthermore, we have a system of family uh, worship, ancestor worship in place, which in which we believe that our, the souls of our ancestors and our own souls stay alive by the worship of our descendants. So again, if you don't have a male descendant, it was believed that your family line would die. And not only would you physically die when you're old and sick, but your soul would die and that of your mother, your grandmother, you know, your whole family. So it was like one big conglomeration of bad things to yeah. you know implement this policy of having only one child so as you all know in the book jasmine's husband decides well he's going to give up that girl so that they have the chance of a boy what has happened is because china's one child policy worked so well because it's intergenerational so now you have people who have grown up as a single sibling, you know, there are no aunts. I mean, we're looking at a system where aunts and uncles have been eliminated because there are no siblings. Uh, that people, you know, especially I think young educated women are thinking, well, I don't need to have a lot of children and maybe I don't need to get married at all. And why would I do that when I'm supposed to be taking care of a man and bowing to his needs when I'm doing perfectly fine by myself? So they have abolished the one child policy and they now have a new propaganda campaign in place in which they are shaming women of a certain age who are not reproducing as desired by society not contributing to this society and they are calling them leftover women uh, because like leftovers on a plate they are not nourishing the society but instead being wasted and that age is late 20s so if you're not married and producing kids by your late 20s in china they are calling them leftover women uh, so that's one reference to the title to the irony of this campaign that went from the one child policy and completely flipped around to leftover women but yet somehow it's still all the women's fault and it's women who are really suffering uh, under both policies. But in the book, it's a reference to the fact that as women, we often need to cut ourselves into so many pieces to be palatable to society. And we can feel like we are what is left after everyone has taken what they wanted from us. Jasmine say, says this, but I think it's very applicable to Rebecca, the adoptive mother as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? The way that um, Jasmine, you st I mean, you start out and you end up on, on Jasmine's side as well, but you start out very much on Jasmine's side and Rebecca becomes more and more empathetic as the book comes, as you go through the book, you know, you start to have, yes, she's got 
so much privilege, but you know, that gradually starts not to whittle away, but you can start to see. I think maybe it's fair to, I is it fair to say that Jasmine, as Jasmine develops some empathy for Rebecca, then we do too. Well, and I think I mean I think you're right that a book always has to have one main protagonist and that protagonist is certainly Jasmine we follow her from the beginning to the end of the book but I love Rebecca and I loved Rebecca from the very first page um Rebecca is deeply flawed and makes great mistakes but so does Jasmine I mean Jasmine does really really not wise things um in the novel and I think that indeed the book is really not about division, but about unity, about how much, even though the two women are on a collision course, right? It is about two mothers, two worlds, and one impossible choice. In the end, I think the novel really is about unity. It's about how much these two women have in common rather than all the issues that divide them. Yeah, absolutely. So where did you start? I mean, you said earlier that you're a big planner. You, you're you not one of those people who sits down and says, OK, where's this going to go? So where did you when you started planning this? What was the what was the thought in your head? Did you, Who did you start with? Where did you start? You know, I started with a very primitive version of the story with a um, character like Jasmine and a child, but it was not Jasmine. And the child was actually a little brother, not a, a, a child. And so I had a very vague idea about this situation. And then I have to say that the, it all came together once I realized that the child was her daughter and Rebecca appeared. I think when Rebecca appeared in my mind, the whole book came together because um, then I understood this is really, um, you know, a book about these two mothers. And at the, the way I had envisioned it originally, it was very much in the Chinese world and the world of Chinatown. And I didn't want that. I wanted Jasmine to also interact really with the Western world, with class differences, with Rebecca. And Rebecca was a fantastic character to write, especially for those of us who love books and publishing, because she is, of course, wealthy and affluent and um, highly educated. But she also, you know, is a publishing executive. And she has an adopted Chinese mo a daughter she absolutely adores. So the book is also an insider's look at the publishing world. I was going to say, why did you decide to make Rebecca a publisher? Did you have a few things that you wanted to say about the publishing industry? Well, for sure. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, it's a world that I love very much and I know very well from an insider's perspective. And, you know, sometimes you see books that are published or advice that's given to people who want to write and it's just wrong. You know, yeah. it, I think unless, unless you're in the world, you don't really know how it functions. So it was really fun um, to write that. And also because I think that it is a kind of job that Rebecca would have had. I think that with um, when you are really kind of wealthy and from one of those old families in the U.S., there's a limited number of professions that are considered worthy um, and, you know, high society enough. And publishing was really a kind of a gentleman's field. You know, it's a field where people who loved classics and literature would work, even the ones who didn't need to work, but sort of as a labor of love. So it made sense to me that she would also work in publishing. Yeah, there's so there's, that feeds into so many different strands, doesn't it? Because there's the sense with both Jasmine and Rebecca that, you know, they're not good enough on so many different levels. I mean, Jasmine, because she was a girl, brought up in a house that didn't want her, and now she's an immigrant and she's got no papers, no language. And Rebecca, because she's got, comes from one of those families where whatever you do isn't good enough you're about about living up to standards that aren't it's all about living up to standards that aren't yours I think that's so astute of you Sam and indeed at the end of chapter one 
um, where in chapter one is where Jasmine goes to the restaurant looking for a job and she runs into her old friend, Anthony. And at the very end of that chapter, she meets Dawn, who is a cocktail waitress um, and who gives her a card and says, you know, you, you should maybe consider looking for a job here. And the last sentence of that chapter is Dawn saying, you know, but don't, forget appearances are everything. And that is what you just hit upon. That's, you know, one of the main themes of the book about appearances and how important they are for women, how often we are judged by how we appear, how often we are obsessed by it, even though we really shouldn't be um, in many ways, you know, physically, in terms of status, etc. And I do think that neither Rebecca nor Jasmine chose to be born the way they were. Jasmine did not choose to be born in rural China. Rebecca did not choose to be born into privilege. She just was, and there's nothing she can do about it. She knows that she was very lucky. And she, like you said, Rebecca has to spend her life living up to having been so very lucky and feeling like she's never good enough and she's never done enough to deserve the privilege that she was born into. Yeah, it's um, the strands, uh, you know, well, it's mainly Mason, the role of Mason. I mean, he is, I wondered if you identified with him a little, not in the kind of, not the, in the fighting really dirty way, but <laughs> in the kind of sense of, you know, he's got a real chip, hasn't he, about, people who he thinks have had it easy and he's had to fight his way into Harvard and he's had to fight his way into the publishing industry and she's just, well, daddy worked there and that kind of, you know, I think he's a fantastic way of making making that point. Yeah, I really loved Mason as a character. So for those of you who may not have finished the book yet, Mason is um, Rebecca's competitor. So he is a editor he's a top editor as well they are both fighting for the same um fantastic author who uh, Rebecca desperately needs to save her career because her last author was involved in a publishing scandal and so Rebecca needs something very strong to show everyone that she's still on top and that she's got integrity and all this and indeed I thought it was fun to make Mason someone from the wrong side of the tracks who fought his way in, but yet is unscrupulous. You know, he's really willing to use whatever he's got to um, to get ahead. And I, that was just a really fun dynamic to write. And there were actually more scenes with Rebecca and Mason that I had to cut from the final version of the book because it was getting too long, but I did love exploring their relationship and their past. However, the film rights um, to The Leftover Woman were preempted immediately, so long before it hit the shelves. And uh, they're interested in that material. So who knows? Maybe some of the deleted scenes will make it onto the screen. So is it a film or is it a limited series? I think they are looking at making it into a limited series of... Um, yeah, a limited series and possibly of more than one season. Wow. Yeah, I could see how like extra material with Mason, but probably also a lot of extra material with Jasmine and developing her more of her with when. Oh, absolutely. I mean, with there's, Anthony, yeah. there's so many places um, the book can expand. And, you know, I, I think it, it, it's always um, a, a question, right? When things become adapted, the, a lot of readers want to see the book on screen. I, I know that that is not realistic, you know, because film is just a completely diff different medium from a book. And so I try to think of it. All four of my books have been uh, optioned for TV and um, film. And I, I just know that, they have to make changes and they will make changes um, to it. And I kind of think of it as they have, a. I, I only allow people to option who I know are very good and who I can trust. And it's almost like you hand them a world and you see how they adapt that world onto the screen. 
Um, so, you know, I just saw a comment that somebody said they loved Oswald. And I, I have to say, Oswald oh, yes. is one of my favorites, too. And in fact, my son thought of Oswald. So I would tell him, uh, I always tell him when people mention Oswald, I really get letters. You know, he shows up yeah. for such a short amount of time. But I get letters from people saying, you know, so, you know, in the epilogue, like, does he, is he still around? Is he okay? Like, what happens to Oswald? Yeah. So I, and Oswald is just fine and loyal to the end. Um, and and does, he get a short head, does he get the short head cat? He does. He does. <laughs> he does. He does manage to get uh, the pet. I know we all worry about him with his pet allergy. He gets his pet and becomes a very powerful um, and, you know, wonderful editor in his own right. But uh, yes, he is a character that I personally really love a lot. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying uh, before we I went off on one about Mason, um, <laughs> about looks and appearance appearances because there is you do have a lot to say in the book about beauty and the weight of it the power of it or the powerlessness of it and the way that the young Chinese women are fetishized absolutely um, and I love the way that uh Jasmine kind of goes on a journey of well I think how do you put it it's something like seizing your genetic peculiarities which I really <laughs> love that as a phrase but she goes on a journey of, you know, of learning to weapon stopping being afraid of her looks and learning to weaponize them I think that is right because you know Jasmine was a beautiful girl in a situation where she had no power and beauty without power is an absolute curse. And so she was used almost like a commodity. I mean, she was basically sold in marriage. And, you know, when, for those of us who are writers and when we're designing a book, what I always think about is that the book needs to be the perfect storm for your character. They need to be a perfect match. So what I mean by that is that whatever your character's biggest issue is, the greatest fear, greatest flaw, greatest problem, the book has to be the absolute worst thing that could happen to them. Um, you know, you can't have someone whose greatest flaw is arrogance and then the book is all about them going on a baking show or something. Like it's, <laughs> they have to be made, they have to be made for each other and they are. So the appearances is one of the biggest themes of the book. Jasmine has to learn to weaponize her own beauty um, to be able to survive. She has to walk that complicated road of being fetishized and earning and using um, her looks as opposed to being used while Rebecca is dealing with appearances in a whole different way in that she feels very much like um, she's got to keep up appearances at any cost at the beginning of the book. And by the end, she's like, oh, screw all that. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there are things that are really important and appearances are not one of them. Um, I wonder, when I was reading it, it, just because it is something I'm quite obsessed with, I was wondering if for you, how the process of aging um, and looks and how it's been, <laughs> how it's viewed differently between your your dual cultures that you've lived across and how that's impacted on you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we all think about aging um, a lot. And I, you know, I have my own philosophy of it, which is that I think that we decide to a large extent how old we're going to be. And I know that sounds really crazy, you know, and of course people can get sick and, you know, there are things that are unavoidable, right, in aging. And we all have genes and, and so on. But I know, for example, that in my own life, I am, if I just allow my life to go the way it would go naturally, I am much less active now than I was when I was in my 20s. I have more money than I did when I was in my 20s. So I can go to restaurants. I can, you know, take a car. 
to go somewhere instead of walking there in the rain and through the subway. You know, I had a million jobs when I was in my 20s and I was running around like a crazy person um, trying to meet them all. So I feel that sometimes, you know, we say, oh, it's my metabolism and it's this and it's that. But it's also just that our life has changed. And I do actively in terms of myself and my own aging process, I do try to actively counteract that. I want to be healthy um, and attractive as long as I can be. And so I don't, you know, I used to be a professional dancer. And when I was 24 years old, I was told I was too old. I mean, my Mm. friend who is a ballet dancer was told when she was 13 that she was too old. Like, it's ridiculous, you know? And there's a point at which you start to refuse what other people are telling you. You know, I was told at every decade that I would lose my looks, lose my waist, lose my hair, lose everything. And I think, well, it's true. I mean, I'm a writer. I have a very sedentary life. Um, If I were not to work at it, not to work at being healthy, not to work at going to the gym um, and so on, then yes, you know, I certainly could look a lot older than I do. But I I think that, you know, in this day of modern medicine and um, all the conveniences that we have, it's a lot of it is about how active do we choose to be? What do we choose to do? And like everyone else, I used to really dread going to the gym. <laughs> you know, I would mm-hmm. like, I'd have the subscription, but I'd be like, oh God, I don't feel like going. I'm so tired. I just want to stay home. But because I went through this year from hell with my divorce and a lot of pressure with the book and publication um, and all coming out, I began to see the gym as a refuge. You know, I began to see working out as not something I had to do, but as time for me and time in which I could rest and not think and not worry and where I could really care for myself. And that made it much easier to go and to, you know, to work out. And it made me feel much better, feel and look much better. So I feel like a lot of it is, um, you know, it's loving who you are. And I think, um, and but also working to keep yourself healthy. I've always loved my body, even when it's, you know, been heavier, when I've been pregnant, when all of these things, because you know, like it's, I have a great body, like it keeps me alive. So my lungs are working, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I have kidneys and all kinds of organs. I don't even know what they're doing, but they're working 24 seven for us. And I think it's a part of, you know, being a woman to love who we are and to be grateful for who we are. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about language, but before I do, I just want to say to everybody, if you've got questions for Jean, please do start popping them in the chat and we'll go to those in a moment. Um, How much do you think that being multilingual, I mean, you speak Dutch, Chinese and English, how much do you think that's influenced your writing and the way that you write? Well, it it has influenced it a great deal because so much of my work is about language and about the ways in which we are seen differently from inside and outside our language. So in The Leftover Woman, hopefully when we're reading Jasmine's chapters, we love her and we feel like we know her and um, we see how she's a wonderful, smart, thoughtful young woman. But then when we step outside of her perspective and we actually hear her and see her from another's perspective or from an English speaking perspective, we realize, oh my goodness, she seems so much more um, primitive than we know her. She's so much more limited than she is in Chinese. And that is how it is when people... um, you know, because I speak different languages, I can see how people are in their own language and how they present themselves outside of their own language. And that can be extremely deceptive. Yeah, I love the way that you build a, a picture of Jasmine as a different woman in Chinese Absolutely. Than, than she is in, in English, effectively, like a completely different person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, and and I think immigrants often do uh, appear like that, that they do seem like 
a totally different person in the language that we may hear than in their own language and culture. Um, why did you choose to write Jasmine in the past tense and Rebecca in the present tense? When I originally wrote the book, um, you know, everything came to me. Both voices came to me in first person present. So that's interesting. I just heard them speak to me in first person present. I wrote most of the book that way. Um, and then I was afraid it would be too confusing for the reader. I also thought that, you know, Jasmine is Chinese, Rebecca is white. And I felt I wanted to distance myself a little bit from Rebecca. I wasn't sure I had the right to write Rebecca in first person. So it seemed it felt right to move her to close third so that I was following her, but I wasn't presuming to fully speak um, in her voice. Um, and then I wanted to have the the time shift again to differentiate the two voices, but also for those of you who have gone through the whole book and gone to the twist, you will see that it, it makes a kind of logical sense that Jasmine is in the past and Rebecca is in the present tense. Yeah, and we won't say just in case, and I know Tanya hasn't quite finished that yet. I've got a feeling you probably have got to the twist, but we won't risk it. Anyway, um, all of your books really are about the kind of hard reality of being a woman and an immigrant in the world. And your first book was published in America in 2010. How do you think that's changed since you started writing? It, there's been a very big change. I mean, when I, you know, it basically takes about two years for the book to hit the shelf from when it's done. And um, when I was looking for an agent and looking for a publisher for my first book, Girl in Translation, which is now taught in schools around the world and has the honor of being banned in parts of America because it is taught in so many schools, um, there was not a market for diverse fiction the way there is now. I mean, there were very, very few voices of people writing from different cultures um, who were people of color. So that's something that has changed greatly and that I'm very happy about, that there's just a multitude of stories that's now available in the world than uh, there was at that time. You fought back, didn't you, against a ban, a proposed ban in Pennsylvania? Did you manage to get that overturned? Well, you know, it was very touch and go for a while. I did fly to Pennsylvania to give um, a speech about our freedom to read uh, in person. That video has gone viral. And I am happy to report that they just had a school board election. And these things are actually decided there by vote, by election, by the school board. And the people who are against banning books won. They swept the field. So that's oh, wonderful. That's so at least in that little county, it looks like um, they will probably be easing up greatly on banning books. But it, it has already been banned in parts of Florida, for example. And it's a kind of copy-paste action where they don't even yeah. read the books. They just move them on. On what grounds have they banned it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you're all right there. Do you, I no, I'm all right. No, I'm good. Some water, like I could give it to you. It's like yeah. no, I know, I know, I'm all right. Um, what they are doing is, um, there is a website that details the reason Girl in Translation is has questionable content. And in about 80,000 words, there are four so-called curse words. They're not even curse words on the level of the F word. I mean, they are words that are basically body parts. Um, so they found four words and they put together all the questionable content and there were four pages of it. And in that questionable content, there's some pot smoking. There's some kissing, which is completely non-explicit with no... Scandalous touching of any body parts or anything um and yeah. there is one sexual encounter which is a complete fade to black sexual encounter and uh one i think this is the real thing one character considers abortion and incidentally does not even go through with it but the thought does come up so it's i mean it's ridiculous it is ridiculously mild um a question from Tanya, 
Chris, were there any particular challenges or joys while writing The Leftover Woman compared to your other book? You know, um, I always do a tremendous amount of research for every single book and this one in particular, because I know that um, it's a very sensitive issue with the birth mother and the adoptive mother. And I wanted to make sure that I did both sides justice. I did not want to write a book that was clearly on the side of the birth mother or clearly on the side of um, the adoptive mother. And so I, um, I spoke to people from every side of the story and to girls who had been adopted, who had been left behind, who had not been adopted, you know, who had grown up in the West, who had grown up in China. So that was really, really fascinating um, to do. I think actually surprisingly, the hardest part to find information on was Jasmine's rural village in China. I wrote the book during COVID. I was not able to travel to China myself. And it was, um, I think I finally found an Oxford professor who had done field, Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember, who had done field research for two years in a rural village in China. And she was phenomenal. And talking to her and reading her articles and seeing her photos allowed me to set the scenes in rural China accurately, even though, you know, it's not a lot of pages in the book, but I wanted to make sure that everything in the novel was as accurate as I could get it. Um. Did you do much other research? I mean, for instance, you know, people trafficking, uh, the opium club. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I was a dancer in New York City. So the line between gentlemen's clubs, strip clubs, and, uh, and of course, Jasmine doesn't become a stripper. She doesn't become an exotic dancer. She becomes a cocktail waitress at one of those clubs. But the line between professional dancers and those clubs is extremely thin because dancers have no money and they usually look a certain way and they are the population that people at those clubs are trying to attract. And what they do is they usually um, get them in, not you know, as a stripper, because of course, everybody's like, no, absolutely not. But they lure you in with the same story they told Jasmine, which is that um, you'll come, you'll make a ton of money. It's a very easy job. All you need to do is carry some drinks around and no one will touch you. We have the whole place filled with bouncers to ensure that nobody actually physically touches you. So people feel like, oh, well, I can do it and still, of course, it's a seedy environment, but I can still be safe and pure in a certain way that I'm only in a bad environment. This is, of course, a lie, but you do not find this out until you are fully entrenched in the system. Um, Di, a question from Di that I'm going to split kind of into two parts. So um, you mentioned you're on a manuscript deadline. Can you tell us any more about that manuscript? Yes, I am working on a new book, um, which is due extremely soon. And it <laughs> is a it is a murder set at Harvard. Um, so I'm excited about it. I did. Um, I spent some time this past summer traveling to Cambridge, Massachusetts back to Harvard to um, just to do research and conduct interviews uh, and so on for it. But it is, it is hard because I'm also promoting this book, The Leftover Woman, very intensively at the same time. So that's a real juggling act to try to do both. That's the other half of the question is um, how do you juggle a writing deadline, a promotional tour? Because, I mean, some people can write, uh, write on those tours, don't you? But switching your head between the two books all the time not so it, easy well and it's a question of time and you know it's funny because I was just at the Kauai Writers Conference in Hawaii with all wonderful writers like Paula McLean, Christina Baker Klein, Meg Wolitzer, um, Mary Kay Andrews, um, Patty Henry oh I'm, so, I'm just blanking on her name. But we have all these big best-selling writers, and you should have seen us because we all needed to, most of us taught um, classes in the morning. And then the afternoon, everyone was like, I have to write, I have to write. And then, you know, they would mm -hmm. all like disappear to their rooms and try to write. But then, you know, we would um, start to procrastinate and then you see them wandering around again. And then they're, mm -hmm. they're at the pool and like, you know, they're kind of following you around. They're like, oh, Jean, where are you going? I'm going to 
blocked you. And you're like, oh, I know. It's because you don't want to go back to your manuscript, you know. Yeah. Um, so this is the eternal problem for writers. And everybody's late, you know. Everybody's under pressure on their new book. Everybody feels like they can't promote and write at the same time. Um, so it's really funny to commiserate with other writers in that way. But yes, it is hard to switch. It's hard to find enough time um, and basically, we're just always late. So, you know, <laughs> that's another reason that I did decide to stay home from Iceland and its volcanoes this week, that it would give me an extra week where I have a bit more peace um, to try to catch up, you know, also with everyone on social media who has been so kind about putting out the book everywhere that I haven't had time to respond to because I've been basically flying almost every day. Yeah, I mean, all those things, all the promotion and the social media and all of that, you know, they take up a lot of time, don't they? I mean, they do. And, you know, when you're on a book tour, the schedule is insane. You know, on a book tour, normally I was getting up at about four or five in the morning. One night I got up at 2.30, you know, a few nights I got up at 2.30. You go to the airport, you fly to a new city, you have a few hours uh, in the hotel room when you can unpack your things, maybe close your eyes for an hour or two, maybe not. Because I also had online events. I had to go to bookstores to sign stuff. I had dinners with people who were, um, you know, professionals. Like I was in Canada. I had to meet. It's The book is a top 10 pick uh, for one of the major bookstore chains. I had to meet with the people there during the day. Then you do the event in the evening. It often runs until, let's say, eight or nine. You sleep a few hours and then you have to get up and you have to do it again. Um, so that's uh, there's very little time left. Yeah, I mean, I think American for British authors, American book tours are always a big shock because it's you know literally like, okay, today's Chicago, tomorrow's St. Louis, the next day, you know, it's completely different. I mean, Nicola wants to know. I um, mean, you've talked about doing a lot of planning for your book, so you know how it's going to end before you start. <laughs> well. I try to know how it's going to end. I don't start until I do know how it's going to end. But I have to tell you, The Leftover Woman was a tremendous challenge uh, because it's an impossible situation. It really is. And I wanted to write it in a way where we would be sympathetic to both mothers. So if you're sympathetic to both Jasmine and Rebecca, how do you end it without it being a real statement that says basically the adoptive mother should always have the child or the birth mother should always have the child. How do you make it end right? And so um, I thought I knew the ending, but at some point in the writing of this book, I have to tell you, everybody was in jail, in bed with each other or dead at some point. Yeah. I, I had killed everyone off at some point. Um, you know, it, it seems like I very cleverly placed a red herring and it seems like, you know, person X was the antagonist. That's probably because he or she was in some draft that I had done because um, it was very hard to find the right ending for the book, but I do. Usually I won't start a book until I not only know the ending or what I know of the ending at that point and the midpoint, like three or four major plot points along the book so that I have the general arc. So the big twist, I did know. The twist I knew from the very beginning that it would be set up the way it was, uh, but it was a question of figuring out how to do it um, and how to make it execute right. And, you know, there were some characters that were supposed to sleep with each other and um, create kind of a love triangle. And I got to the moment, I wrote to the moment where they were supposed to engage with each other. And, you know, she was just like, I'm not doing him. You're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to work she's like I'm not interested in him in that way in the slightest bit so then you have to rip apart those plot strands and uh, rewrite to make it all work out anyway so how do you balance because it is a really you know it's really propulsive and page turning but at the same time you have got these, you kind of go on these emotional journeys with both the characters, which I think, I suppose I think is one of the definitions that makes it a literary thriller as opposed to just a thriller. Um, how how do you balance those things? What do you, when they fight, what do you prioritize? 
Well, you know, the thing is that um, for me, a book always starts with the ideas and the themes, right? I always think about what is it I'm trying to say? What is it I care about? What am I actually, what do I actually want to write about? Um, so that's that's the heart of the book. And I do, I am very careful about structure and pacing. I'm very aware of my reader. So I want my reader to have a great time. And I want there to be a fantastic storyline um, that will kind of suck you in. And that would be enough. But if the story conflicts with my theme, I would never allow that to happen. I mean, everything, my books are all taught in schools. And they're taught in schools because they are internally coherent. And what I mean is that the metaphors all make sense. The themes all make sense. Every piece of music, every reference in the book, nothing is random. Everything is shedding light upon the theme in a way that I have thought about. Um, so, you know, basically the, the them thematic coherence of the book has to work. I would never have something happen that is in violation of what I'm trying to say. But that said, I make sure that the narrative structure is perfect, as perfect as I can make it. So I would also never sacrifice the, the story for the theme so that the story starts wandering away or is meandering or, you know, is um, not emotionally fun to read or not emotionally um, resonant or truthful. I mean, that's why I couldn't force those characters into bed because it's like, you know, at a certain point, you know them. And I don't know them either at the beginning. I don't know them as well as I will by the time I've written them to the middle or three uh, 75% point of the book. And at that point, I do know them. And if I do something to them that they really wouldn't do, you know, an astute reader, I mean, readers are so smart. They're so thoughtful. An astute reader feels violated and manipulated. I mean, I do. I've read books where I have just thought, oh, I'm so infuriated by what the author just did here, um, you know, and I would never want to do that to my readers. So I'm always trying to have a wonderful storyline and thematic coherence at the same time. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, I think we should let you go to bed now. But thank you for joining us. And I really, really appreciate you not cancelling on us after you uh, got off the plane. Um, and thank you for writing this wonderful book. And I can't wait to read the next one already. So crack on and meet that deadline. Um, and everybody else, I'll see you this time next month with Nina Stibby. So thank you, everybody. Um, good night. And sleep tight, Jean. Thank you so much for having me. I think you guys are a wonderful club. And Sam, you're such a fantastic um, writer and reader. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>